Making headlines tonight, President Maitripala Sirisena assures solutions for nursing service requests. First at 9, this is Other Therana 24-7. Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe lands in China for Belt and Road Forum. Talks with President Xi scheduled. Nepal President Bidya Devi Bandari in Sri Lanka for UN International Vesa closing ceremony. Hand grenade attack on Sri Lanka Medical Council premises. Making international headlines, cyber attack on computers across 99 countries. Good evening, I'm Indi Vriyamwatha. We start off with news from the Prime Minister's visit in China. Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe arrived in China to attend the Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, which is scheduled to inaugurate in Beijing tomorrow. At the invitation of Chinese President Xi Jinping, at least 28 heads of state and other delegates are expected to gather for the two-day forum. The Sri Lankan delegation to the Beijing summit headed by Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe arrived at the Capital International Airport in Beijing, China this evening. Sri Lanka's delegation to China includes Ministers Dr. Sarath Amunugama, Rauf Hakim and Malik Samara Vikrama. On the sidelines of the summit, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe is expected to hold bilateral discussions with both China's President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang. The Belt and Road Forum, to be conducted with the participation of 65 countries, will be inaugurated tomorrow under the patronage of Chinese President Xi Jinping. The forum is planned to explore ways to address regional and global economic problems, generate fresh energy for interconnected development and ensure that the Belt and Road Initiative delivers greater benefits to people of the countries involved. The Belt and Road Forum will be the highest level forum under China's One Belt, One Road Initiative since its launching over three years ago. It encompasses 65 countries which stretches from China's coast to Africa and Europe via the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean in one direction and to the South Pacific in the other direction. Also in your headline making news tonight, a hand grenade suspected to have been thrown into the Sri Lanka Medical Council premises was discovered this morning. The grenade was later defused by the police special task force. Meanwhile, condemning the incident and expressing solidarity with the Sri Lanka Medical Council, Government Medical Officers Association emphasized that it will not bow down to any acts of intimidation. An unidentified group had thrown the hand grenade into the Sri Lanka Medical Council premises along Norris Canal Road in Colombo around 11.30 last night. Despite hearing a noise, security officers at the premises had failed to identify what had taken place. The live hand grenade was then discovered early this morning by the security officers and they had immediately contacted the police over the emergency hotline 119. The police special task force was then called to investigate the incident following the directives issued by the Maligakan, the magistrate's court. The police STF successfully removed the live hand grenade from the premises of the SLMC and took it to an isolated area at the Grand Pass Community Cemetery. Police were able to successfully defuse the hand grenade, identified as an M4 bomb. Police sniffer dogs were deployed for the preliminary investigation this morning. The government analysts have also obtained testimonies related to the incident. During investigations, police discovered the safety pin of the hand grenade at a location near the Sri Lanka Medical Council. Meanwhile, the police crime division has commenced further investigation into the incident. We informed the minister and the president also. We take this as a very serious issue. If this blasted, I think it will carry a lot of casualties. And this is not the first incident that happened to Sri Lanka Medical Council. In 2002, Medical Council was burned. Then in 2004, there was a bomb attack to 
the former Sri Lanka Medical Council President, consultant, uh, Dr. Charles Samarthin. Then Professor Pandita Ratna was the register that time, was assaulted. And uh, in 2012, again, there was another hand grenade attack to the Vice President, Dr. Lalankaran Singh's house. Then Dr. Nonis had an attack in front of his house. Recently, a few months back, our assistant registrar, Dr. Chandanatha Pato's vehicle was attacked by unknown people. This is the last incident. And unfortunately, uh, the police didn't find, found anybody who suspects about these uh, issues. And when you come, come to the Sri Lanka Medical Council, the council is, you know, consists of 25 people, including many professors, all deans in the Ghana State Medical Faculty, all are doing an honorary job. Nobody is employed to Sri Lanka Medical Council. And it's a government institution, and an independent institution. On behalf of the people in this 20 million people in this country, uh, the government has to find out the people who have done this attack. And uh, justice has to be served for Sri Lanka Medical Council. I don't think otherwise we can expect the independent service from the Sri Lanka Medical Council. We are going to have an emergency council meeting on coming Wednesday, and we are not going to stop any services that we are giving to the people. We are keeping all the documents related to 25,000 doctors and all foreign medical colleges, Sri Lankan medical colleges, private medical colleges, and all the documents related to court cases. If something happened, if this lasted uh, sometimes, documents also be destroyed. So these are serious issues here to Sri Lanka Medical Council. The Government Medical Officers Association also condemned the incident at a media briefing today. This is very clearly a string of events and these string of events are related to private medical schools. There are eight incidents. So far, the authorities have failed to arrest a single person responsible for the string of attacks. It's very clear that these substandard private medical schools may be trying to get Sri Lanka Medical Council through acts of intimidation and these are physical attacks and there are other acts of intimidation by the ministers and by the so-called self-proclaimed civil activists who are repeatedly threatening the Sri Lanka Medical Council. On the 15th, we will have an emergency executive committee meeting and on the 22nd, we will have a general committee meeting to discuss these issues. Addressing the media following an event held in Kalania today, Inspector General of Police Pujit Jasundara assured of a just investigation into the incident. I give my word to carry out this investigation fairly. Things cannot be done immediately, so I promise the investigations will be fair. President Maitripala Sirisena emphasizes that the government will not hesitate to meet the requests of nursing service. The president made the comment whilst addressing a function organized to celebrate the International Nurses' Day in Colombo today. The International Nurses' Day celebration was organized by the Public Service United Nurses' Union at the Royal College, Colombo. <laughs> I said to all that this event will be held under the auspices of you. But then the Director General of Health Services did something unacceptable. Don't mind me saying this. I sent him a letter saying this event will be held not for the trained nurses, but for the ones who are yet to. But the day before yesterday, he had mentioned that the President or the Minister would not come and that we shouldn't let the students participate in the event. I am condemning this incident in front of the President. Minister, this is what happens when you appoint ill-suited people to positions. The Venerable Thera told me that the Director General did something unacceptable. I tried to contact him, but couldn't. I assure you that he did not speak with me recently. And it doesn't matter what your political ideology may be, Please cooperate with the government for the development of health services within the country. What I have to say in brief is that I will not hesitate to give anything required for the health services. Meanwhile, the event for the International Nurses' Day, organized by the Government Nursing Officers Association, was held at the Sri Lanka Foundation today under the patronage of President Maitri Pala Sirisena. Ministers Rajita Sena Ratna and Ravi Karuna Nayaka also participated in the ceremony. <laughs> Now
Welcome back. President of Nepal, Bidya Devi Badnari, arrived in Sri Lanka this morning in lieu of the United Nations Day of Vesak celebrations. The Nepali president is here in Sri Lanka to attend the closing ceremony scheduled to be held in Kandy tomorrow. The President of Nepal, Bidya Devi Bandari, touched down at the Katanaika Bandaranaika International Airport around 11 this morning. Minister of Justice and Buddhisasana, Vijayadasa Rajapaksha, Minister of Foreign Employment, Talata Atukorala, and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Harsha De Silva, welcomed the visiting Nepali Head of State. Later in the evening, the Nepali president attended a cultural event in Colombo. A multicolored, multicultural pageant got underway here at the Nelum Pukuna Mahindra Rajapaksa Theatre in Colombo. This was part of the second day of the 14th United Nations International Vesak Day celebrations held in Sri Lanka. This event was presided over by the visiting president of Nepal, Vidya Devi Bandari, who is on a five-day official visit to Sri Lanka. The Nepali president was welcomed by President Maithripala Sirisena, Speaker of Parliament Karajaya Surya, and Minister of Justice and Buddhisasana Vijayadasa Rajapaksha. The pageant, showcasing the history, traditions, and various aspects of Buddhist culture, brought vibrant cultural performances from countries including Sri Lanka, China, and Vietnam into the spotlight. The Nepali president will preside over the closing ceremony of Sri Lanka's United Nations Day of Vesak celebrations in Kandy tomorrow. She will leave the island on Monday. A commemoration ceremony in remembrance of late Minister of Foreign Affairs Lakshman Kadragama was held at the Lakshman Kadragama Institute this morning. The late Foreign Minister of Sri Lanka was instrumental in the adoption of the Vesak Day Resolution at the United Nations General Assembly on the 15th of December 1999. The commemoration ceremony for late Lakshman Kadragamar was held with the participation of Minister Vijayadasa Rajapaksha and Deputy Minister Harsha De Silva. The late Foreign Minister's efforts in the advancement of Sri Lanka's diplomatic relations as well as the development of Buddhism internationally was remembered. The late Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lakshman Kadragamar, realized the dream harbored by Malala Sekara to hold an International Day of Vesak in Sri Lanka. Although he wasn't a Sinhala Buddhist, we should not forget leaders like him since he was an epitome of coexistence. Sri Kalyani Vesak Zone is conducted for the fourth consecutive day today at the sacred Kalaniya Raja Mahavihara premises organized by the Past Pupils Association of Sri Kalyani Dharma Vidyalaya in cooperation with TV Derana. Those who visit the Sri Kalyani Vesak Zone can witness the pendals based on the story of Kalinga Bodhi. In addition, the public can also indulge in dancers, puppet dancers and other decorations. The Vesak zone will be open for the public daily from 6.30 in the morning until the 14th of this month. A large number of people visited the Kalaniya Raja Mahavihara last night to witness the Vesak zone. And moving on to some political news, developments surrounding the North Central Provincial Council took yet another turn last evening with a group of its provincial councillors meeting with former President Mahinda Rajapaksa at his Colombo residence. Following the meeting, United People's Freedom Alliance parliamentarian Shahan Semasinghe said the joint opposition will take a number of decisions that will challenge the administration of the North Central Province. Joint opposition councillors of the North Central Province have decided to remain independent. Sixteen members of the North Central Provincial Council met former President Mahinda Rajapaksha to discuss the prevailing situation of the Provincial Council last night. 
Mahindra Rajapaksa advised us to work as a team. 17 have already signed up and another minister spoke to us over the phone with the view of joining us. We will table a document with 17 signatures. The party general secretary Duminda Disanayaka made a statement pointing out that I was removed because my wife is unwell and that it is difficult for me to carry out duties in that position any longer. 17 of the 21 members of the government are with us. In addition, 18 out of the overall provincial council membership of 33 are also with us. A lot of decisions that will challenge this government will come from the north-central province. Also from the political arena, State Minister Sujiva Sena Singer says that he will not hesitate to leave the United National Party if he is not given recognition. The minister made the remark addressing a women's program in Kolonnava today. The recruitment of women from Kolonnava for the program to accumulate 20,000 women for self-employment in the Colombo district was worked off today at the Kolonawa Divisional Secretariat. You know that I played a prominent role during the election. When we came to power, we can't have opportunities by force. I have got the post of state minister in a ministry. But sometimes, the PN can get things done which I'm unable to. The Gazette on my post says, resolving conflict. It does not have any power. Although we do a lot before coming to power, they might not make use of us after coming to power. I work with the principal in the United National Party. If they do not serve me right, I would leave the party. I will not hesitate to take that decision. Usually the first eight are cabinet ministers. Colombo is not an easy district to exist. I will be in politics as long as I can. I will leave politics when I can't. I apologize for not being able to do much in this government. The leaders have their favorites and they get the opportunities. The day I feel I can't continue, I will leave politics. I will leave politics but will not change parties. And now we take a look at a few other local stories making news in brief tonight. A dengue outbreak has been reported from the region surrounding the Kurunagala Teaching Hospital. Director of the Kurunagala Teaching Hospital, Dr. Chandana Kandangamua, stated that at present about 110 confirmed dengue patients as well as 180 suspected cases are receiving treatment at the hospital. With a significant number of hospital staff also suffering from dengue, patients already receiving treatment at the hospital are facing difficulties. Meanwhile, a nine-year-old schoolboy succumbed yesterday to injuries sustained from a motorcycle accident. The child, a resident of the Talakiriagama area named Varnita Yasoba Jayasurya, was struck by a motorcycle as he was crossing the road while returning from religious observances for Vesak. The Galewela police stated that the motorcycle had struck the child upon a zebra crossing without heeding the command of the police constable on duty at the scene. The child was initially admitted to the Dambula Hospital and was later transferred to the Matale Hospital for further treatment, during which he was reported to have succumbed to his injuries. And in your business headlines, the Lanka Indian Oil Company has declared a loss of 652 million rupees for the first three months of this year. In a statement, LIOC attributed the quarter's performance to losses incurred on the sale of petrol and diesel. The company quoted the depreciation of the rupee and increase in the prices of petrol and diesel in the international market for the margins on petrol and diesel becoming negative. Despite the fourth quarter loss, profits for the financial year ending 31st March strengthened to 3.07 billion rupees compared to 200 or rather 2.223 billion rupees the previous year. And in international business stories, the US and China have made the first deals under the 100 days of trade talks that began last month after U.S. President Donald Trump took a far gentler approach than promised with Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping. Action will be taken by mid-July to increase access for U.S. financial firms and expand trade in beef and chicken as Washington attempts to address its trade deficit with Beijing. By the 16th of July, China will allow imports of 
U.S. beef and the U.S. will issue a proposed rule to allow cooked Chinese poultry to enter the U.S. market. And U.S. retail sales increased broadly in April while consumer prices rebounded, indicating a gradual rise in inflation, which could keep the Federal Reserve on track to rise interest rates next month. Yesterday's filing by the Commerce Department said retail sales most or rather rose last month 0.4% after a gain of 0.1% in March, a boost of 4.5% on a year-on-year -year basis. In a separate report yesterday, the Labor Department said its consumer price index rose 0.2% after dropping 0.3% during the month of March. In the 12 months through April, the CPI increased 2.2%, exceeding the 1.7% average annual increase over the past 10 years. And in your sports, we start off with the Indian Premier League. Delhi Daredevils defended a modest total of 168 against the rising Pune Supergiant. Despite a poor start to their innings and uh, ominous knocks from Pune batsmen Steve Smith and Ben Stokes. Delhi won the toss and put themselves in, but two wickets in three overs had them reeling at 11 for two. Karun Nair and Rishabh Pant were to rescue the Daredevils though, with Nair sweeping his way to 64 and Pant hitting two sixes in his 36. Struck it, struck it well. In their reply, Pune lost Ajinkya Rahane in the first ball of the innings. Manoj Tiwari top scored with 60, but while Smith and Stokes both looked in fine form, they fell in the 30s. When MS Dhoni was run out, the writing was on the wall, and some fine bowling from Delhi at the death helped them to a seven-run win. And in tennis, Rafael Nadal is on course to continue his storming start to the clay court season as he moved into the semi-finals of the Madrid Open. Nadal will play Novak Djokovic, while Dominic Thiem and Pablo Cuevas make up the four in the penultimate round of the tournament. Rafa Nadal already has the Monte Carlo and Barcelona Open titles under his belt this season and looks firm favourite in Madrid as he took down world number 10 David Goffin in a high-quality encounter. Nadal blew eight break points to only edge the first set, then romped home in a spectacular second to win 7-6, 6-2. After Pablo Cuevas beat Alex Zverev to take the third semi-final spot, Dominic Thiem faced off against Andy Murray's conqueror Borna Koric. The young Croat was not able to pull off another upset as the world number four produced a controlled performance to win 6-1, 6-4. <laughs> And in the biggest news from football, Chelsea have clinched the English Premier League title with two rounds to go with a win at West Brom. Having finished 10th last season under current Manchester United manager Jose Marino, Antonio Conte has completed the revival he was signed to bring about, winning the league in his very first season. Chelsea went to the Hawthorns knowing that they only needed three points in their last three games to assure themselves of the title, and it seemed for a long time like they were going to leave it till next week. But Mishi Batshuayi's 82nd minute strike put them on course, and the Blues held out to claim the win and the championship, 10 clear off Tottenham who cannot mathematically catch up. With eight minutes to go. The season is nevertheless not over for Chelsea and Italian manager Antonio Conte, as they contest the FA Cup final against Arsenal in a fortnight. And in your headline-making international story, a massive cyber attack using tools believed to have been originally developed by the U.S. National Security Agency has struck organizations around the world, including hospitals, major companies and government agencies. Computers in thousands of locations were locked by a program that demands a ransom of 300 U.S. dollars in Bitcoin in exchange for the release of files.
Computers in 99 countries, including the UK, US, China, Russia, Spain, Italy, and Germany, have been infected, with a top cybersecurity firm stating that it had seen 75,000 cases of the ransomware attack around the world. The National Health Service in the UK was hit hard, with hospitals being forced to turn away patients and cancel appointments. Experts say the attack may have been built to exploit weaknesses identified by the U.S. National Security Agency in Microsoft systems. The World Health Organization has declared an Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The WHO confirmed that at least one person died after contracting the virus in the country's northeast. The representative for the WHO in the Democratic Republic of Congo stated, out of nine people suspected to have contracted the deadly virus, three had died. Among the deceased, one case of Ebola was confirmed through tests at the National Laboratory in the capital, Kinshasa. More than 11,000 people died in the 2014-2015 Ebola epidemic in West Africa, mainly in Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia. In your weather forecast for tomorrow, fairly strong winds of up to 50 km per hour can be expected over the northern half of the island during the next few days. Showers or thunder showers will occur at several places in most provinces during afternoon hours. Rains can also be expected in the western Sabaragamo and southern provinces during the morning hours. We now take a look at the city-by-city -city weather forecast. That's all from your prime time news at 9. I'm Indivriya Amwakta. Do join us tomorrow, same time. But before we go, we'd like to leave you with visuals of Vesak celebrations from across Asia, including India, Nepal, Malaysia, Singapore, and Mongolia. Their celebrations, expression of devotion, are broad and diverse. Yet, they track back to the same core of the 2,600 year old events of the thrice blessed Vesak Full Moon Poya Day. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Adhavarana 24-7.